last few years about a billboard campaign that uh, the American atheists have uh, have been engaged in. They, they've used it around the country. Now, I've not seen one personally anywhere, but here in the South, I guess that they're not as active. But, but uh, one of them has a picture of the Magi on their way to the manger. And, and you see, uh, this is a billboard, I think this one was in New Jersey, that says, you know it's a myth. This season, celebrate reason. Okay, so there's, there's a battle raging in there. There's another billboard that reads, I think these are newer, but, but what myths do you see? And of course you see Jesus alongside Poseidon, a Greek mythological god, Santa, and Satan. A myth. Hmm. So, still another billboard shows a pic of Santa with a bag of toys on his back. And a picture of Jesus with a cross on his back and implores, keep the Mary and dump the myth. Now, well, now I'm really astonished, really, when you think about it, these atheists attempt to declare Jesus a myth. And you want to know why? Because the historical birth and life of Jesus is one of the most widely recorded events in all of history. It's not a myth. You know, the, the events and places in the life of Jesus have been supported by archaeological evidence and extra-biblical writings along with biblical writings and personal testimonies of untold numbers of people for centuries. To say Jesus is a myth is utter ignorance. That's what it is. It really is. They also have one reading, Who Needs Christ During Christmas? Nobody. I think it's especially hilarious, this one is, because any fool that can read or hear can tell you can't have Christmas without Christ. It's right there in the Word. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but this thing's been going on. I, you know, furthermore, you know, while shopping the last few years, you've likely been greeted with happy holidays maybe a little more often than the traditional Merry Christmas. You know, uh, why is this? Well, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Our nation, and really the world, our world is under attack by secular humanism and postmodern ideas that reject God and the foundation of God's Word and instead celebrate immorality. That's what's happening. See the latest Duck Dynasty debacle for a, a, a little input on that as an example. Unfortunately, homosexuality gets singled out as a sin, but it's primarily because you know we're being forced to accept this obvious abomination to God, if you read in Scripture, as a normal act. But homosexuality, homosexual activity is, is a sin just like fornication, just like drunkenness, just like adultery, and it should never be accepted and definitely not celebrated. Okay? And that's what the Word of God teaches us. And, and you know, but listen, let's get back on, on point here. Many believers, or excuse me, many unbelievers like these atheists attempt to make themselves feel better by pretending that Jesus is not real. That he wasn't who he claimed to be. That there's no way that he was God. And so if Jesus is not God, then to them, then they're not accountable to a creator. And that gives them the freedom to live life as they choose and to celebrate immorality and any decision about anything they want to do in life. And in that way, they can choose to ignore their sin, which obviously has a negative impact not only on society, but on themselves. But they refuse to acknowledge that. So they often find solace because their faith, because the atheists have to have a pretty big faith to not believe in God, believe it or not. And they base their faith on presumptions of science like evolution and things like that that obviously you know, are, 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 are false and can't be repeated. They're not fact. They're, uh, it takes more faith to believe in evolution, I believe, than it does believe in God. You know, but yet they, they, and they reject the truths, I think, that are obvious in Scripture and archaeologically supported and scientifically supported. <laughs> but listen, just as many reject Jesus today, folks were rejecting him in the first century. 
It was happening then. Many refused. And we've talked about that. And we've seen that as we've worked our way through Acts. As, as we preached and we saw. that We've seen how the Pharisees and the Sadducees would reject Jesus. And they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And that's why they crucified him and so on. But they refused to believe that Jesus was the promised one. And that's why Paul, when he went about preaching and the disciples and the apostles, they went about preaching. They went back to the Old Testament and they would prove that Jesus is the Messiah. The promised one. That's what they preached. Convincing people that He is the Son of God. He is the one. And, and that's why Matthew began his gospel by providing evidence that pointed to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah and Redeemer. That's what he's doing. And so by the time Matthew wrote his gospel, thousands of Jewish Christians made up the church. And, and we read, you know, how Jesus spent his time with the disciples after his resurrection for 40 days. Over 500 people saw him at once alive after he was dead. They saw him ascend into heaven. And in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, uh, his disciples said, Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? And so you see the disciples, they were looking for the promised one. They were looking for the one that's going to restore the nation of Israel. They were looking for the coming king. And Jesus is the coming king, but that wasn't the time. You see, they weren't looking for a baby to come to be born. They were looking for a king to come and, and destroy the enemies. And that's going to happen. But first, the, the promised one had to die. He had to live and die. And that's what Paul and the disciples did. As they went back to the Old Testament, they pointed out the suffering servant, the babe that would be born in Bethlehem, the, the Jesus that would live a sinless life. And you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and we see after the sin of Adam and Eve and God pronouncing upon them the curse of death, uh, God promises them a seed. <coughs> Excuse me. He promises them a son. But not just a son, the son who would come to redeem them in Genesis chapter 3. And what, the one he's talking about is the promised one. And Matthew wanted to, uh, people to understand that the rest of the Old Testament is the story of God interacting with his people to bring the promised one. And Matthew was showing us here in, in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus is the promised one. That's what he's trying to get us to see. And that's what I want us to see this morning. So as we look at this text, we see three reasons to believe that Jesus is the promised one. So that's what I want to see this morning. Number one, the first reason we see in this text to believe that Jesus is the promised one is this. Jesus has the right earthly pedigree to be the promised one. That's the reason for the genealogy. You see, when you look in Jewish history, the most natural and essential way for a man to begin the story of his life is to give his genealogy. They would memorize their genealogies back to Abraham. It was typical for, the, for a young man, by the time he, he got to be 13 or 14 years of age, and definitely by the time he was married, to be able to recite his genealogy if he was a Jew all the way back to Abraham. And so it was common. This was important. It was, it was greatly important. But Josephus, who was a historian, and this is Josephus is one of those guys who's a secular writer who wasn't a believer in Jesus, who wrote about Jesus and the disciples. That, make, that helps us to know that Jesus is not a man. He's real. And Josephus, he was a Jewish historian, and he wrote his own autobiography, and he began it just like this, with the book of his genealogy. But King Herod, the Herod uh, that despised Jesus that had the babies killed, he was despised by pure-blooded Jews because Herod was half Edomite. And so what that means is he was half Jew, but an Edomite was a descendant of Esau. And so he was half, half you know, the enemy of Israel too. <laughs> and so as a consequence, what Herod did was he destroyed all the official registers that had the genealogy so that no one could prove a more authentic pedigree than his own. And so all the written documents he had tried to destroy. So it was difficult for anyone to find anything recorded about their genealogy, their pedigree. But here we have one for Jesus. Recorded. <laughs> And so Matthew begins it by saying, the book of the genealogy of Jesus. And his first reference is to Jesus Christ. You see that? 
In verse 1, he says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And remember now, I've told you all this, but Christ is the Greek word for the, old, uh, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, Messiah. Messiah. And so by saying Jesus Christ, uh, Matthew is saying Jesus the Messiah. By saying Jesus Christ, he's saying Jesus, the promised one. Jesus, the anointed one. And so his immediate reference to Jesus as the son of David then in verse 1 points to a reference to that royal kingly line. You see, Jesus was a descendant of David, that renowned king of Israel, the, the, the most famous king of Israel. And the lineage was traced back through Joseph, in Matthew, Jesus' adopted father. And so if you turn to Luke chapter 3, you don't have to, but you can turn over there right now if you'd like, and you can mark it, or you can read it later, but you'll see an alternative lineage. And when you read Luke chapter 3, the lineage goes all the way back to Adam. But, there, the, but the, the names are a little different, and there's lots of different reasons for that, but one of the most popular reasons that is given is because the lineage in Luke chapter 3 is the lineage of Mary. Because Mary was also a descendant of King David. And so if you follow that, this interpretation would mean that, that Jacob was Joseph's biological father. And then Healy in Luke chapter 3 was Mary's biological father. And so Joseph's surrogate father, you know, Healy, it's not really strange in their culture for Joseph to be considered the son of Mary's father. Especially if Mary's father didn't have any other sons. Because what they would do, if Healy had no sons, it would have been a normal custom. He would have been known. Joseph would have been known as his son. And especially if they lived under the roof, he would be called his son and a descendant. <clears throat> and so, listen. Although it might have been a little bit unusual to trace the genealogy from the mother's side, let's remember. Let's remember this. There was nothing usual about Jesus' birth. You know, his mother was a virgin when she bore him. And his father is the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing normal about that. And so for it to be a little bit of a variant here, you know, is probably right for us to help us to understand. But, but listen, if Mary is indeed a direct descendant of David, like Luke chapter 3 would say, then that would make her son the seed of David. And that keeps right in line with those prophecies about the Messiah. And so why am I telling you all this? What does all this mean? Well, listen, just stick with me here for a second because what this means is regardless of whether you trace the earthly descendants of Christ through Joseph or Mary, what you find out is either way he's a descendant of King David. That's what you find out. You know what that means? Why is that important? Because in prophecy, Samuel wrote uh, that when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, he's talking about King David, he says, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And he talks about in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that of his kingdom, the throne of his kingdom will be forever. <coughs> And he says, your throne will be established forever. And according to all these words and according to all this vision, Nathan spoke that to David. And so what's Nathan, the prophet, talking about that Samuel recorded? He's talking about Jesus, the descendant of David, because no other king is going to establish a king forever except for one. And his name's Jesus. He's king forever. And so when we look at verse 2, we see Matthew refer to Jesus as the son of Abraham. A reference to the line or the promise of the line of grace. And so Matthew begins his genealogy with Abraham, who is called a friend of God. And, and, and Matthew speaks a lot of the kingdom in, the, in his gospel. And, and it was important for him to show Jesus was a descendant of David. And being a direct descendant of David, you see, Jesus had the earthly pedigree to reign forever as the king of the Jews. He has the earthly pedigree. A lot of y'all are too young to remember this, but in 1991, there was a movie called King Ralph. And uh, I don't know if you've watched it or not, but it, it, it's really a funny movie. Um, but it, it, a free, in, a, in this movie, a freak accident killed all the known members of the British royal family. 
And uh, uh, so they did a, an intent survey of genealogical records, and they finally uncovered an illegitimate son. And uh, he was an American by the name of Ralph. And uh, he was, he was uh, a side, I'll just put it that way. But, but anyway, it was an entertaining com comedy from what I remember. And, and it was just a simply made-up story that had a lot of weird twists. And, but a similar analogy of searching for a worthy pedigree for the rightful heir to the throne. What we have here. Because while the story of King Ralph is fiction, the story of Jesus is not. And so what I'm telling you is the record of the lineage of Jesus and his right to the throne of Israel is real. Just as real as the same lineage that proves the two rightful heirs to the British throne today are Prince Charles and his son, Prince William. You follow me? You can say Jesus never existed and you can doubt it and you can hang billboards up and you can, you can, you can make it less real if you want to. But let me tell you this, if, if they had DNA testing in the first century, Matthew may have written this, the likelihood of Jesus being a descendant of David and Abraham and a rightful heir to the throne of Israel was found to be 99.999% accurate. The only reason I say not 100% because humans do the test and they might be a little error, okay? But, but Jesus is king. And he is the only rightful king of the Jews. And he's the only rightful king of the universe. We need to worship him. He deserves our praise and he deserves our glory because only Jesus has the earthly pedigree to be declared the promised one. And we see that here in Matthew. But not only does he have the earthly pedigree, when we look deeper into this text, we see that Jesus has the right heavenly paternity to be the promised one. You follow me? He's got the earthly pedigree because he's a descendant of David, and that was a requirement. But he's also got the heavenly paternity. What do you mean? Uh, well, to put it bluntly, his father is God. That's what I'm talking about. Who else can make that claim, right? I mean, we call God our Father, but only because we're adopted because of Jesus. But to understand the birth of Jesus, we've got to understand uh, three steps in Jewish marriage, okay? So I'm going to try to throw those out for you today. The first step was the engagement. And that was a contract by family members who determined whether the couple would be well suited for each other. And, you know, for marriage. And so then there was the betrothal. And that was the public ratification, and it lasted for a year. And the couple would become, they would belong to one another. They would be known as uh, being married, but they did not live with one another as husband and wife. It was a one-year kind of a probationary period. They were under contract of marriage, but not living as a married couple. And then the final stage, uh, once that year had passed, the the, the husband would go and he would prepare a place in his father's home for his bride and they would usually bring that bride back to the father's home and when he went to get her and bring her back then the marriage was consummated and, and so the only way that this betrothal period could be terminated was by divorce and so the Jewish law, in the Jewish law there was a phrase which states that a young woman whose fiance dies during the period of betrothal is called a virgin who is a widow. So you get the picture. She's a widow, but she's a virgin. And so that's significant for us to understand what was going on here. And so Mary and Joseph, they were in this second stage. They were in that betrothal period. And the third stage is the married proper, and that's what took place at the end of the year. And, of course, they hadn't got there yet. And so the birth of Jesus as king is referred to in three ways when we look here in Matthew. Jesus Christ, the Messiah we talked about. He's Jesus the Savior. He's Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Christ is the Greek form of the Greek word or the Hebrew word for Messiah. Jesus is the, the Hebrew word Yahshua, which means God saves. And Emmanuel means God with us. And so we go to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And Isaiah wrote, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and call his name. Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. Jesus was born of a virgin. The story had, listen, we, you know how we can know? A lot of people dispute that, don't they? The atheists, you know, if they believe Jesus existed, which is utter ridiculousness that they don't, but 
But, but they would debate that because nobody can be born of a virgin, right? But the story, listen, you read the story. The story has Joseph, her betrothed, wanting to put her away privately as we read here. And so, so we know the child's not his because he wanted to divorce her. And so we know it wasn't his child. Everyone would have known the child wasn't Joseph's by his reaction. Of, you know, they could have probably told. And he wanted to divorce her privately, showing he loved her and he was a good man. But he still wanted to divorce her because he knew it wasn't his child. Well, not only do we know, do we know from Joseph's reaction that Mary was a virgin, but we also know from her own testimony that she was a virgin. Because when the angel came to her, the Mary asked the angel, said, how can this be? How can I be pregnant since I've not known a man? And so by her testimony, you know, she's, she's a virgin. And so it wasn't Joseph's kid. Mary don't know whose kid it was. And so, uh, you know, because she was still a virgin. This was no ordinary birth because this was no ordinary child. <laughs> amen? Amen. Got any ameners out there? We confused you. But listen, <laughs> a little boy... Asked his mother where he came from. And you know how that goes. You know, the little ones come up, you know, where do babies come from? You know. And, and so his mother gave him a tall tale about a beautiful white feathered bird. Okay? You know, I, I don't know where these come from. But, but, the, but so the boy says, well, I'm going to go ask the grandmother. So he went to the grandmother and asked the same question. He got a variation on the bird story. You know, a little different, but pretty much the same thing. So he went outside. He's playing with his friend. He says, you know what? He said, I found out today there's not been a normal birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. <laughs> normal birth. So I guess he knew more than I thought he knew. But anyway, many births, you know, might be considered unusual for various reasons. I, I heard one time about a baby being born in a taxi. Saw one being born underwater, you know. And, I mean, there's, a, there's some weird stories. We got some weird stories, you know, and I shared some of those with y'all last week. But, but I'm sure you've heard a lot of unusual stories, but there's only been one birth, like the birth of Jesus. And there's no other one like it. Because, listen, if a paternity test was performed on Jesus, you might hear Mari Povich say, Joseph, you are not the father. You hear me? <laughs> And then learn that <coughs> Jesus' father was not even of this world. None other than God himself. That's what you would hear. Jesus is God in flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us, John writes. And we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus. People saw him. They saw his life. They saw this holy one of God. And they knew he was the promised one. Even his own mother. You may put up a sign on a billboard mocking the birth of Jesus, but that doesn't keep Jesus from being Emmanuel. That doesn't keep Jesus from being God in flesh. You know, Jesus has the right earthly pedigree to be the promised one. And he has the right heavenly paternity to be the promised one. Do you know what else? Jesus also has a life, has the right life of fulfilled prophecy. Because no, there's been no other life like the life of Jesus. He's the only one who's lived life like he did. The life of Jesus proves he was the promised one because he's the only one who's fulfilled the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the promised one. He's the only one. Isaiah 7, 14 and 15 that we talked about earlier, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You know, the prophet said that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Guess what? Jesus was born of a virgin. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the prophet Micah writes, but you, Bethlehem, Small among the thousands of Judah, yet from you shall come the one who will be ruler in Israel, whose goings on are from old, from everlasting. Whose goings on are from everlasting? Who's born, whose goings on have been from everlasting? There's only one that can make claim to that. And his name's Jesus because he is eternal. And he, my friend, was born in Bethlehem just like the prophet said he would be. The prophet said he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Hosea chapter 11, uh, verse 1, 
God's word says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And so the prophet said that the, the Messiah would come out of Egypt. Well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. How could he come out of Egypt? Well, we know the story because Herod had all these babies put to death. Joseph and Mary was warned and they fled to Egypt. They stayed into Egypt until Herod's death. When Herod died, we know the story. <coughs> Excuse me. The story says that once Herod died, Joseph and Mary came up out of Egypt. So who came up out of Egypt? Who was born in Bethlehem? Who was born of a virgin? No one but Jesus. That's who. Now Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, children refusing to be comforted for her children. So primarily here, uh, Jeremiah was writing about uh, the captivity and Jerusalem being in cap captivity in Babylon and that type of thing. But it's it's Matthew uses this Old Testament passage in a new setting, uh, fo focusing the hopelessness in the in Bethlehem for its hope in the future when th those children were put to death. And so we see that story being fulfilled around the life and birth of Jesus. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23, we read Joseph and Mary returned to Nazareth. And Matthew says that, listen to what Matthew says. He says that it not be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Who was born of a virgin who had children murdered around his birth, who came up out of Egypt, born in Bethlehem, uh, known as to be a man from Nazareth, none other but Jesus. You getting the picture here? Nobody else can lay claim to these prophecies. We can go on and on and on. But I think you're starting to see the picture. You see, what happened here was just like when Christy and I went on our honeymoon. We booked a cruise. We went, uh, we went uh, to, on a carnival cruise in the Bahamas. And when we booked it, we flew out of Knoxville. We flew down to Orlando. And the lady that, that, that our travel agent said, when you get off the plane in Orlando, you'll walk down... And when you come out, to, when you start to leave the airport, there'll be somebody there holding a sign that says Carnival Cruise Lines. You just follow them. She made that prophecy. Guess what happened? When we got off that plane and we come down that escalator, there was somebody there standing there with a sign that said Carnival Cruise Lines. And you know what they did? We followed them. They put us on a bus and took us right to the ship. Just like she said. She was a prophetess. <laughs> But guess what? In a similar way, but only with hundreds of years between the predictions, Jesus did exactly as the prophet said he would. He lived that life as the suffering servant without sin. He died on Calvary's cross. They mingled myrrh and gall and gave it to him on the cross. His side was pierced. His blood was poured out. He rose from the dead. All those things, 300 prophecies and more, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is our Redeemer. Folks, that's not a coincidence. That's God at work. That's the truth. It's not a myth. Jesus is real. And He, and He alone is the promised one. None other. Muhammad can't live up to this billing. Confucius. No other but Jesus. He is the promised one. Believe it, because it's true. A couple of men didn't get together and write this book. This book was put together over hundreds of years by many different men. It couldn't have been planned by anybody but God. You think it's not real? You better do some investigating, because you get down into truth, folks, and you'll find out archaeological evidence that many religious scholars had disputed whether the Old Testament passages were true. They dug up the Dead Sea Scrolls that were written hundreds of years before Jesus. Guess what they found out? They found out hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. The Bible that some people say was made up after Jesus lived, hundreds of years after Jesus lived. When they dug up the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found out that hundreds of years before Jesus, the Bible said exactly then what it says today. You know what that says to me? And I don't need that. Because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And I know, but you know those things are just God saying, I told you. I told you. 
It's true. It's true. Jesus is the promised one. He is our only hope. He has the earthly pedigree. He's the son of David, just like the Bible said the promised one would be. He has the heavenly paternity because he was born of a virgin. He is the God-man. Not a God-man. The God-man. The only one. And he has the life of sinless perfection fulfilling all the prophecies. He is the promised one. And the Bible says Jesus is Emmanuel. He is our Savior. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Bible says that if that we've all sinned and we've been separated from God because of our sins. But the Bible says that uh, and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so because of our sin, apart from Jesus, what we earn is, is death and eternal separation from God in hell. That's, that's what the Bible teaches us. But God loves us. And He sent the promised one to redeem us. And the Bible says today that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. And so maybe you're here today. Maybe you've spent your life. Maybe you've thought just like these atheists with these billboards that oh, all this, all this Christian stuff, all this stuff about Jesus is just a myth. Somebody just made that up hundreds of years ago. And it's just filtered down to where everybody's just delusional now about it. No, no, no. It's the truth. It's the truth. Jesus is the promised one. He's your hope. He's the only way we can miss hell, be delivered from our sins and enter into an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father. So right now, the Bible says if you'll call out to the Lord, if you'll call out and, and confess your sins to Him, if you'll invite Him into your heart and life, He'll change you. He'll, be, he'll, he'll forgive you of your sins. The Holy Spirit will come into you and indwell you and empower you and live through you. <coughs> if God's speaking to you this morning to do that, with every head bowed, everybody just bow their heads right now and just close your eyes. If you'll say this prayer, if you'll say, Lord, Lord Jesus, I understand this morning that you're the promised one and, and I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. And I confess my sins before you right now. If you'll do that right now, the Bible says that he'll hear you. If you'll invite him and say, Jesus, I want to turn away from my sin and I want to quit living my life my way and I want to live life your way. If you'll make that commitment to Him right now, the Bible says He'll change you from the inside out. If you make that commitment this morning, just pray that prayer. Father, we give You this time right now. God, I pray that today, right now in this place, You'd begin transforming work in hearts and lives. God, raise up people to do Your work to bring a time of renewal, revival, and repentance in our world. We ask it in Jesus' name right now. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to stand with us right now. Everybody's going to go ahead and stand. But I want you to stand. I want you to let us know. <coughs> if you prayed that prayer this morning, just, just, even if you can come up right now, let me know. We'll pray. We'll rejoice with you. Maybe you're too nervous to come up now. Before you leave, just tap me on the shoulder and say, I prayed that prayer. I want you to pray for me. I want you to help me. We do that. We won't embarrass you. We won't call out your name. We just want to know. We want to help you. So, but right now, maybe God's speaking to your heart, maybe your life. Maybe you've prayed that prayer. You've been a believer for a long time. But maybe there's been some doubt. Maybe you've not been living your life the way you should be. Maybe, you, maybe you've not been uh, giving your all for Jesus. And, and this morning, maybe God spoke to you and you realize Jesus really is who he said he was. And, and, and you want to get things right with the Lord. You want a new start. We do that this morning. We want to invite you to come as we sing. Let's just kneel. Folks, if God's speaking to you right now, just come, let's kneel. Let's get things right with the Lord. Come on as we sing.